Okay, you got me. Got me good. Berserk is just different. But I'm having straight Vietnam flashbacks right now. Currently, I'm not exactly seeing the greatness of Berserk just yet. Okay, this shit is next level. I I'm not even lying. Kentaro Miura really is just a different breed when it comes to storytelling. My name is Abisu, and welcome to a blind review of Berserk. Since the Golden Age arc is so long, I'm going to be breaking it down into four parts. Yeah, I know, four parts is a lot. No, I won't do it quicker. Like, I have to work a full-time job right now, and this is already hard enough for me to do. So this part will only cover the first quarter of the Golden Age arc, or just about the first film. You know, quite handy. The exact chapters covered at 9 through to 28. And what could have been handy is a signal to tell me that this arc starts at 0 and gets to 100 so quick. Like, I still got a whiplash from that. Like, it was interesting to see where Guts was born and how he actually came out of a dead woman. Well, I assumed at least, since we don't really know. Might have died after giving birth, you know, technicalities. But that shit was already setting a whole tone for the whole arc. And then what follows was just not expected. Miura was really teasing me with Gambino. I really didn't know until the very end whether he was giving Guts a hard time, since he's technically... kind of... His adoptive father, but not really, since he didn't see Shisu as his girl in a way. Well, he was hiding it to preserve face in front of other mercenaries. And what I thought was just tough love really just turned into something far worse than I could have imagined. I'll give you time time to skip if you're not interested in hearing me talk about dark topics to do with minors. Right, this shit really shocked me so hard and just explains why Guts doesn't let anyone touch him most of the time. Gambino sold his body when the dude was 9. I, I don't even have the vocabulary to just explain how terrible that is. I that was just truly a vile scene. But the revenge that Guts got was so sweet. That shitbag Donovan can rot in hell. Well, now that we're over with that, we can move on to a nice bit of storytelling I noticed. Well... Not really hard to notice if you're really paying attention to the story. There is an interesting parallel between the way Gambino was blaming Guts for his misfortunes and the way the girl from Black Swordsman was blaming him for her misfortunes too. So I wonder if Guts was actually crying at the end of Black Swordsman because of the old memories floated back to him or something. He was already worn down from the battle and then an encounter with Demon Griffith and even further on top of that, a little flashback. Even then, you know, the... The tough face that Guts is putting on could be crushed quite easily. And then comes this panel. Bro, th this panel crushed my heart. I don't know why, but this shit was so sad. Bro, just look at his poor little face. Like, I'm not a mopey person at all. But this shit really hit me in the feels. Guts does nothing wrong. He's blamed for his existence, and now Gambino tries to basically assassinate him. Bro, I'm, I'm not for it. They are literally bullying this poor little child. And of course, it doesn't stop there. After defending himself and killing Gambino, but all the other motherfuckers decide to try and kill Guts now. Like, I understand none of them like him, and this is just realistically an excuse to try and kill him. But if you see Gambino's dead body in Guts' tent, do they really just think that Guts killed him just for no reason? Like, it's so plausible that Gambino would go out of his way to try and end his shit at some point. And the last nail in the coffin ends up being the fact that Guts gets jumped by wolves. And like, they've really jumped this guy like there is no tomorrow. It was like looking at the comments under a Makima cosplay. And Guts stands his ground, bro, he slays all of the Makima stands. And then what, what do you expect to happen to him? Bro, he, he runs into another mercenary group. I, how ridiculous is that? There's no one else traveling this world. Why is there another mercenary group? Literally like next door to the other one. It makes zero sense. Well, actually it does since... They probably were both hired for the same battle. But like, come on. And there he meets other characters that I knew of before Slank Berserk. I've seen Casca and Griffith before, but of course I didn't know anything about them. Except like, a spoiler about Casca. But I honestly have no idea what actually happens, or like, really anything. I just know like, you know, like, a single plot point. And this is the real beginning of Berserk to me. This is where all the meat and bones will be. Or you know, at least the appetizer. You know, Black Swords one was more like the breadsticks. Can you tell that I was hungry whilst writing the script? Bro, this mercenary group is just insane. They were defending a siege from Guts and his old group, and extended the siege from three days 
to three months? Do you realize how insane that is? Like, these guys are a whole new breed. And you know what's even more insane? Bro, how strong Guts is compared to them? Like, he just meets them and he's instantly number two in their ranks. Bro, beats Casca, who's in third. Bro, Guts ain't no feminist, that, 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 like, that's all I'm gonna say. And then Captain Twink, he's just some next level shit. This dude has finesse like no one else. And we get to see this so much throughout this arc. Bro, dude is just straight saucing. Bro, you drip or you drown, and this dude is dripping so hard. He's so much stronger than Guts. Bro, he's just not human, I swear. Wow. Okay. I don't know why I'm including this, but gotta do my boy Guts wrong and point out how this dude somehow managed to have a nightmare and basically a wet dream in one. I have no idea how someone manages that, but I guess if it was to be anyone, then it would be Guts. Sometime after that, Griffith just starts being all sus and shit with Guts. Bro, he's talking crazy, being like, I want your Guts. Well, we can't have what we want. I want your mum, and it doesn't always happen. And you know, after being sus with the boys, you always say you need to have a fight. Now, this, this is one sick fight. And something is telling me they will definitely have a similar fight later on. Or at least like a similar type deal. I honestly think that like there will be a super cool fight whenever Griffith is about to turn to the dark side or something. I, I, I can't wait. But this fight did kind of remind me of One Punch Man at times. Like the way Griffith fights reminds me of that moustache dude and then obviously the famous One Punch Man bite of the sword. I, I, I just can't believe how badass Guts is and just how determined he has been. A dude already lost and has a sword pointing at his throat. So what is he gonna do? The guy bites the sword! Uh, bro, it, it was really fun seeing Guts use actual hand-to-hand -hand combat for once. You know, instead of just being a master swinging a huge sword around. Just what a fight. Just what a fight. Then we get to see how Casca has actually fallen hard for Griffith and it's so clear right from the start how she just holds him up on this pedestal and clearly cares for him more than anyone else. I mean, I don't blame her. This dude is just insane. Handsome, strong, and legit 300 IQ strategist. They held out a siege for three months thanks to Griffith, and he's just absolute 10,000 IQ plans. And now this is where I kind of run into a small issue with this part of the story. It has nothing to do with the writing, as that is just superb. Excellent on all fronts, but they are is just a little bit confusing. Mira has proved to me that he has made an insane amount of progress with art. The fights are insane, and the anatomy is on point for 95% of the time. But the horse chasing was just confusing. And as a lot is happening, and it, it's just very hard to make out who is who or what is going on. I know you can make the excuse of it being intentional and it just portrays this scene accurately, but come on. As a reader, I just want to be able to follow the action easily without having to decipher what is going on when I'm, you know, just reading a given page. Overall, I was happy with the horse chase scene. Just a bit weird at times and it was hard for me at the time of reading. But, you know, it is what it is. Hey! Rare panel found. <laughs> found a rare panel. Not that rare of a panel, but I know this is somewhat iconic and, you know, comes back quite a few times. Looking forward to it. This scene is pretty important overall, since this is where the Hawks start to welcome Guts into their circle. Even though he completely ruined the first impressions by fighting them and, if I remember correctly, literally slaughtering like two of them. But it is just a really nice scene, seeing Guts being welcomed in and him actually warming up to people for once. Also notice that we meet the first black character in the Hawks. I think at least. I have no idea what ethnicity Casca actually is, so maybe I'm wrong. But hey, not all characters are going to be just white in the story, which is always welcome. Also, I just love the fact that Pippin exists. Bro, this dude just picks up Guts like it's nothing and carries him down. But then Judah also kind of mentions Griffith and his duality. And that is definitely something I will talk more on later on. Also, the fact that the girl is called Judah is worrying me. <laughs> Last time I did with long hair, trust the Judah, it didn't end well for him. Maybe this time, the fact that Judah is trusting a long haired guy is going to be downfall of this situation. You never know. <laughs> Bro, the water fight with Griffith and Guts, that was so pure. You know, a little bit homosexual since Griffith was naked, but it was a heartwarming scene nonetheless. It, it, it was fun, I can't lie, that, that was a really nice moment. Bro, and then Mura just has to shock us. It goes from a fun moment 
to my balls crawling back into my body. <laughs> Why in the world does Griffith have a bailer? Oh bro, is he already a demon once God meets him? Like, does this explain the two personalities that he seems to have? Like, these were definitely the questions that I was having at the time. Obviously, we'll get a bit more juicy information on that later on, but you'll have to wait and see what I thought about it. Bro, Muri's just on point when it comes to drawing parallels to early points in the story. Bro, like, Gus had the same reaction to the bailer as Puck, which was honestly quite amusing to see. Like, this scene was just overall pretty good humour. Like, I think Miura does humour really well, he doesn't force it in like I do, and then when he does put it in, it actually lands. Yet again, the opposite of my humour. And yet again, I'm I'm just absolutely shocked by Miura's progress as an artist. I mean, just look at this beautiful use of perspective. Like, I know it's nothing like groundbreaking, and like, it doesn't necessarily look amazing, but like, this is the same guy who was just struggling to draw anatomy at some point. And like, it's only been like a year since those early chapters. Just absolutely amazing progress. You know, still a little bit weak on some fronts, so just horse chase scenes. It's, it's beautiful progress. Hey, if it's not another time skip. <laughs> like, this story really loves time skips. Like, from what I heard from a very special friend of mine, traveling this world would obviously take a while. So time skips are frequent with things like that. So, you know, the story sometimes just jumps like months ahead of time. You know, I do kind of like that. But as of this time skip, Guts is 18 now. <laughs> Let's go! Like, sus comments definitely gonna show up sometime. You know, I'm warning you beforehand now. Bro, I also found out that Guts becomes 6 foot 8 at some point. Bro, this guy playing with the wrong Hawks. That says a lot. Here comes McCready! Oh, he just sucked the gravity right out of the building! But other than his appearance changing, he's actually become a lot more warm to people and actually cares for his men and tries to protect them when he can. Like, I, I really like the fact that he wants to change himself and is putting in effort, but also just soul crushing to realise that something just changes in him later on and all of that progress is just gone. Like, I'm definitely someone who definitely has some bad personality traits that, like, I've developed. And it's so hard to constantly keep yourself in check. So I just have a lot of respect for Guts for trying and actually slowly becoming a better person, even though he's been through so much. And seeing him become angry at the fact that someone says that he doesn't care is really something. He has so much passion for his men and the way he just cares for people. Honestly, Guts is the go, honestly. Hey, yo, Griffith moving up in the world too. Bro, he's getting that bread, bringing up the homies too. Bro, respect. Wait, he was adding extra weight to the sword? Bro, no wonder he's swinging his huge ass sword one handed. No homo. And here we go. Oh, can I make a wife out of a hoe? And here we go. We finally run into a demon at last. You know, for a second I thought I wasn't reading Berserk. This is some motherfucker called Nosferatu Zod. Nosferatu Zod. Yeah, whatever. Zod. Bro, Zod off. <laughs> My hue was awful. This demon is clearly strong. Like, bro, just look at this dude who barely made it out. Like, there's like half of him missing? But uh, how the fuck did this dude make it out with, like, with his injuries? Like, once Guts runs in, we clearly see that the corridor is huge. And like, he has to walk for, or like run for a while to meet Zod. So you're telling me that guy with half of his body missing walked all the way there from where Zod was and like it didn't collapse or die in the meantime. That is such horse shit. No chance you made it that far. Bro, you, you can't trick me, Mura. Bro, I, I see right through you. You can't guard me. <laughs> Too small. <laughs> bro, this demon is shown in such a brutal way. Bro, he, he just stood there with three dudes impaled up on a sword. And, and then, bro, you just stood there like a fucking idiot, butt naked. Like, what an absolute moron! <laughs> like, put some clothes on! Like, just because you're an idiot and sold your soul doesn't mean that you don't have to wear clothes. Like, bro, this isn't like a nudist club. Just wear something. And I, I, I just can't stop talking about the art. Like, Bura, just calm the fuck down! Like, why are you leveling up so much? Like, he really must have grinded hard. Like, to become so much better. Just look at the anatomy at some point. 
Like, everyone usually thinks that drawing a big muscular dude is easy, but like, it's the exact opposite. Like, he needs to have perfect knowledge of all the muscle groups, like, to like, draw it from his mind, or just like, an insane reference image. And then he goes ahead and stones me with another beauty of a chapter drawing. Like, I, I know it doesn't look insane and doesn't really look good compared to his future art, but like at this point in time, when Mira drew this, bro, he's flexing. Like, he fixed everything I saw wrong with his art. The anatomy is accurate at all times, and then he's drawing interesting poses and perspectives. Bro, I, I really just can't wait to see what the art is like later on. I, mean, I just know Mira's gonna go absolutely fucking super saiyan. Alright, let's get back to the fight instead of me just creaming myself over the art. Yeah, yeah. The goat is being smacked around like a little bitch. Also, by the way, this is where some hype XXXXX Tentacion came on. So, you know, I really got the full effect of the fight, you know, with the music that I was listening to at the time. RIPX. Bro, Goats really is struggling. Like, he does prove his strength. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, Goats was doing fairly well for a human in the fight. But then Zod is like, nah, just time to pull a fucking transformation out of nowhere. Now he's bigger, stronger, and he just apparently turned himself into Wolverine. Like this dude is just reg like regenerating like mad all of a sudden. Obviously, you know, Griffith arrives with help, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but the funny part is that like, the guy joins in. <laughs> And then he just starts being clapped with goats. <laughs> it's like he tries to come in and be like, oh no, don't bully goats. And then he starts getting bullied too. Like, <laughs> this shit's so fucking funny. And then, bro, just. Bro, how does that, a bailer save them? I, I don't get it, bro. Like, yeah, the egg of an emperor, really cool, but like, what the heck? Why, why does Zod just stop? Oh, oh yeah, also shout out to the dude who taught me how to pronounce Bela. Just absolute legend. Because, you know, saying a Bela, I don't know, I just find it a lot harder. But, you know, it's obviously also, like, an acceptable way to pronounce the word. I just think Bela is just so much easier to say. On the other hand, I, please don't rush me, dude. Like, I, I'm trying my best. I have a full-time job right now. Like, it would be nice to make money off YouTube. But I can't, because people like you aren't subscribed. Ha. <laughs> uh, nice transition, huh? Gotta hand it to me. Now subscribe. Bro, Zod is really out here calling you that Guts is just gonna die due to that bailout. Like, I, I mean, we know that Guts doesn't die due to the sacrifice. We know, what, what's really to say that Zod meant sacrifice and, you know, not the fact that Guts might die later on? You know, we will see. We will see. Oh my god, holy shit, can Casca be an absolute bitch sometimes? Holy shit. Goods doesn't be a literal demon, and, and she has a go at him. Like, oh my god, what is wrong with you? Like, bro, you go and try and fight a demon. Even Griffith gets his shit clapped, bro. And you trying to ride on his notes, bro. Maybe if you helped Griffith, then he wouldn't be hurt as bad. Oh no, but Casca would rather just shout at Goats and then be absolutely fucking useless afterwards. Asshole. Bro, on the other hand, the Hawks really made a name for themselves. Like, these guys are moving up in the world, like, moving up far in the world. They went from just mercenaries to literally being the strongest army in the Midlands. Like, th that is some progress. Griffith is holding a lot of political power now too. You know, like, he gets hurt a little bit and then, like, all these motherfuckers come out of nowhere and start visiting him. You know, obviously some actually being worried for him. And, you know, the others trying to keep up a persona, not five bars. And as mentioned, not only has Griffith been distant from the Hawks since he's become a knight, but he's also appearing a lot less in the manga. Like, it went from him being there all the time to rarely really appearing. It does make sense since he is a lot busier now, but it also makes me suspect him even more, like, than before. He has a bailiff, and, you know, he becomes evil at one point, and then Guts has the mark. Ah... Uh... You know, just the fact that he will betray Guts is just living in my head rent free each and every scene that he's in. And due to the fact that, you know, Griffith moves up in the world, we get to meet the king. You know, kind of cool. I did think that, you know, he was going to be an asshole just judging from his design. But, you know, he, he seems like a good earnest man who cares for his people. Why did that sound sarcastic? But the same can't be said about General 
Julius. Yeah, Julius. Now, he's what we call um, a wanker, you know, here in England. You know, twa is also an appropriate description for him. You know, just overall a con. Like, Griffith saves the princess from, you know, just face planting. And then Julius is like, oh, no, I'm gonna smack you for that. Like, like, bro, where is the logic in doing that? Like, oh, the, he saved the princess, so you're gonna smack him? Huh? I mean, it doesn't matter, because Julius is still a bitch. And, you know, he just ends up taking L's when going against Griffith. Oh, my God. All right, this, this one's definitely gonna hurt. Gert swore his sword to Griffith. Like, like small detail. Well, oh, small detail. Knowing what happens in the future adds so much tension. Like, a good swear his sword and, like, the, 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 what's gonna happen now? You know, the, when does it happen? Wh why does it happen? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, uh, Mura just has me right by the balls. I can't. All right, I would like to just hold on for a second to just to recognize how absolutely smooth Griffith is. Like he has game like no one else in this story. Like he's handsome as fuck to begin with, and then he also has game. Bro, this, this is not fair at all. Leave some women for the rest of us. Like goddamn. Ooh, now this is an interesting scene. The assassination scene. Julius sets up a scenario where he tries to kill Griffith so, you know, he can stop taking L's from him. Spoiler alert, it doesn't happen. So during the hunt where the nobles are having fun, he finds a moment to have Griffith assassinated. Poisonous arrow to the heart. Ah! Oh no. But bro, like, th this is bullshit! No way the arrow got stopped by the bailer. Like, that is so anticlimactic. It's like the things in movies where, like, a bullet hits a coin or something, or like hits a book inside the coat or something. Like, come on, bro. Th this bailer is saving Griffith way too many times. Like, if this happens once more, that is just genuinely way too convenient for him. I understand it's like, oh yeah, like egg of an emperor. It's gonna help him become a ruler or some shit. It's gonna give him power in the end. But fuck off. And of course, you know, right after what happens. Griffith instantly knows who is, you know, trying to assassinate him. And, you know, who else would it be other than the big loser, Julius? Like, bro, this guy was taking his frustrations out on a child. Like, <laughs> just because shit wasn't going his way? Like, what a fucking bum. <laughs> bro, <Right. laughs> and now he's the one that's going to get assassinated. Ha! <laughs> Fuck you, Julius. Oh, twat. And this is where things start going downhill. You know, Guts is sent to assassinate Julius, you know, which he obviously succeeds at. But I feel like the story is definitely going downhill after you kill that child. Like, and I don't mean in quality, I mean like, you know, Guts is not going to have a good time. Like, I, I really do think that is the start point of just shit not going his way for a bit. And it's not like he wanted to kill the child or anything. Like, he just got unlucky that, like, he was there at that moment. And the, the kid saw his face, and, and there was just nothing he could have done. And, like, Guts shows so much remorse after. And, I mean, this is, like, the same guy who doesn't care if he kills a grown man. But he clearly still has his head on straight and, like, does it as a job and not something, like, he enjoys. You know, he isn't just a murderer. I also have a small theory about how Guts lost his arm here. Since, you know, when he was escaping uh, after killing Julius and child he jumped into a sewer which means he was in shit and piss water and since there was a wound in his arm that could have got infected and obviously in those days if something gets infected badly you know you're just gonna have to get rid of that shit but um then my dumbass theory got shattered by the fact that the wound is way higher up his arm than you know the actual point where it's cut off later on but come on like my theory makes sense, like, you can't be jumping into shit and piss and then not expect to get infected. Comment down below if you think I have a point or not, because I definitely think I have a point. But why am I caring about realism in a story with demons and shit? I don't know. Dude, the Casca being nice to Guts is such a welcome change of pace. She clearly notices something different about him and actually helps the dude out in time of need. You know, honestly, mad respect to Casca for that and, you know, just not being a bitch. Like, I do reckon she does care about him a lot more than we get to see. Like, she just doesn't want to show it. You know, she is a little bit jealous of him and his relationship with Griffith. But I do have faith in Casca becoming, you know, an absolutely top-tier character. This is Kintaro Mura that we're talking about here.
and we finally approached it. The final scene. Oh, holy shit. The, the, the final and probably the most important one too. Like, this is where the story, like, just sets in stone itself being like an absolute 10 out of 10. Like, everything before this has been incredible. But this is just next level now. The scene of Griffith and Charlotte at the fountain. What a fucking scene. To experience the greatness, you obviously have to read it yourself. And you probably have if you're watching this. Never would have guessed. Griffith has a cool monologue about chasing dreams and shit. Which I kinda agree with. But there is just one major point that I just have to disagree on. Griffith says this. The life that seeks just to live another day is unacceptable. And... I, I, bro, I disagree. There is, there, there is just nothing wrong with just living sometimes. Like, you don't always have to have a goal or just, like, the next thing. Like, living for the moment is more than just fine. Like, it, it, it's an acceptable thing to do. Like, not having a dream is fine. Like, you know, just living is cool, but, but for people that do have a dream, like, and this is where I agree with Griffith, like, if you have something you really want to do, and you never really try and reach that goal, now that's something I don't really stand behind. Like, bro, just chase your dreams while she can. And after this amazing speech, bro, the guy just backstabs everyone. What an absolute plot twist. Like, I, I genuinely never expected this. Even though he does betray everyone later on, but, you know, I, I just didn't expect it. Like, Griffith doesn't see a single hawk as a friend, or even an equal. Like, bro... After all they've been through, he has the balls to say that. You know, Guts is obviously around and hears this. And the guy just swore his sword to him, like, what, like, two or three chapters ago? And he just did, like, the dirtiest job of his career so far. I mean, he had to murder a child. That is just soul shattering. But the real question is, does Griffith actually mean what he said? I mean, he could always just be lying. Like, I, I, I don't really know. But I do think that the theory of him having two personalities can work. You know, he's portrayed so differently from panel to panel. Like, literally, the colour of his skin changes. Like, bro, that doesn't happen usually. Like, you know, like, one scene, you know, like, white. And then the other scene, you're all of a sudden, like, tanned. You know, like, he has this, like, kind side. And, you know, he's nice. And then he has this cunning and ruthless side to him. I really don't know what to think here. It's an incredible plot twist, but what does it actually mean on a deeper level? Or like, how is this story going to play out now? And I ended reading on that. Wow. What what a point to stop on. The guts literally just gets used. We, we think that Griffith doesn't care for anyone. And, you know, he's just using them to reach his goal and will sacrifice anything for that goal. But I think now is an appropriate point to talk about how Black Swordsman is the perfect arc to come before this one. Like, it does so much to the story by adding so much tension each and every time Guts and Griffith are on the page together. And now going f like forward, you knowing that Griffith is using everyone, uh, he's just adding so much tension and like so much like spice to the story. Like it also becomes nice to like try and draw these parallels between the the future and the past to see how things evolved and you know how perhaps some things just never changed. At this point, it's really just become waiting to see where and when Guts just ends up being betrayed or just, you know, fucked over. I'm guessing all the Golden Age arc is in the past, so we won't get to see present time Guts for a while. But, you know, I'm not all for it if this is the standard of the story. We are those incredible characters. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Like, you really can't predict the way someone will act or what they're really thinking. If last time I was saying that I didn't see the greatness of Berserk, now I definitely do. And knowing that it only gets better and more complex, oh my god, it, ha it has me so excited. I, I can't wait to finally read more and probably just bust a fat note when I see something cool happen. I, I just can't wait to be convinced that this is the best manga ever written. Like, I I'm really on board with it. And honestly, if not for the review, like, I would have finished this thing already, like, uh, probably a long time ago. But, you know, we have to keep the integrity of the review. Yeah, I'm a professional like that. If this is how good the first quarter of Golden Age is, then I just can't wait to read more. Subscribe, read Bakuman, and peace.